Good morning, FX Street. It's Mike Tomlin from FXCDU. All right, so let's get started. So we're looking here. Uh, we see uh, Euro. I've got a little 30-minute chart up. Uh, Euro, so we put in a little double top up there above 138. We're starting to pull back a little bit. Um, you know, Ed was talking about uh, a little bit earlier about how he doesn't really have much confidence in uh, the Eurozone and what's going on over there. And while I definitely tend to agree, so, uh, you know, while it is difficult to uh, trade the Euro from a longer-term perspective, you know, there's some really good short-term trading opportunities. And, of course, you know, I had one earlier this morning I'll show you where I just, you know what, I don't know, one of these times where you just get so bored and you decide, you know what, I'm just going to bail out of the position. And, of course, I jammed out for... Um, just a small little gain right here, um, thinking that this thing wasn't going any further, and I got fooled by uh, the correlation to S&P, um, which at the time was showing a little bit of divergence. Uh, you know what? Let me pull it. Um, I'm just going to pull it on the five-minute chart and show you. Um, so there was Euro. It was just sort of sitting in there. It was in this very tight range. It was so stubborn. And then all of a sudden, we got S&P, and it started moving up a little bit here in the morning, and I thought, oh, man, here comes the euro reversal. Maybe I just better bail out. I had a 137, take a couple of pips, and then whammo, S&P tank. So uh, <laughs> you can see how that goes. So sometimes when you're talking about correlations, you know, you just have to uh, kind of, you know, figure out who's leading who. And, you know, my, my sort of thesis and premise was that, you know, with earnings season coming out now, that, um, you know, stocks would be leading some of these global risk events. But, you know, on a day like today, that's apparently not the case. So it's an uh, interesting story. So we know uh, J.P. Morgan came out with earnings this morning. And, uh, you know, the bar has been set so low on all of these U.S. corporate earnings that, uh, you know, it's, it's – I don't know how the market's going to react when these guys start beating. Because, you know, they beat by a little bit, but it's still lower than last time. And, you know what, we, we all know the global economy is slowing. We know about the risk themes that are out there, all right, what's going on in the Eurozone. Now we've got a uh, uh, sort of a, a – clock ticking, if you will, which I don't know if you think about it, but when you sort of sit in a room and you can hear a clock ticking, it's sort of annoying, you know? And that's kind of where we're at with markets right now because, you know, we've got this uh, uh, Franco-Prussian uh, deal coming out here between uh, Sarkozy and Merkel saying, all right, well, early November, we're going to have the, the resolution to the euro debt crisis. And, you know, I've I got to say, I'm just pretty skeptical about this. I mean, you know, I think back to college, you know, when you get like a, a, a paper or an assignment that you do. You know, and you say to yourself, all right, well, you know, this thing's due in, in, in 10 days. And when do you end up doing it? Well, you do it the night before, right? <laughs> I mean, how often did you finish the paper a week in advance and say, okay, cool, that's done? So, I mean, if we don't see something that comes out of this, uh, you know, a lot sooner, you know, we're going to sort of start, you know, falling into that mode where all of a sudden, you know, what, what, what are they sitting around on uh, scratching stuff out on cocktail napkins, uh, you know, right around the time that they said that this resolution was going to be done? So, you know, I'd, I'd like to see something a little bit sooner to uh, see the markets uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, get a little bit more confidence. So let's swap back to the euro here and see what's going on. Um, looks like maybe we're starting to put in a little bit of a bottom here. I think uh, 136.80. Um, let's just jam it out a little bit. 136.80 seems to be a decent area of uh, uh, support. If we look here, kind of see that, um, well, maybe it's even a little bit higher, but just going to add this little line right here. Uh, there. Okay. And we can see that, you know, this area has served as a little bit of resistance. It's got violated there before. So now perhaps this is going to be support. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, um, you know, that I'm thinking about is that, okay, you know, we know about what's going on in the Eurozone and how this is a problem. But, you know, there's got to be a point where people, you know, want to stick their cash somewhere. And I think that, you know, this market is just begging for some sort of uh, certainty to emerge so that, you know, people can get back to buying stocks and taking these risk assets. I mean, think about it. If you're a hedge fund manager, man, you, you want to buy if you can, you know, because, uh, you know, your returns haven't been so hot this year because the market's tanked, you know, and there's a lot of guys that are, you know, you can talk about these long, short equity funds, but, you know, a lot of these guys are just stock pickers is what it comes down to. So, you know, people are really hoping for this rally, but we need the certainty, all right? We need the Eurozone to uh, uh, come out with the resolution, all right? And perhaps we need some help here in Washington, D.C. as well, you know? Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. But um, let's, uh, I'm just going to make this a little bit more granular here on the Euro. Let's keep an eye on see if this area of support's going to hold. But it looks like we're just putting in a little bit of a bottom here. We've got uh, fast stochastics uh, pretty oversold, all right? Not great candles. But perhaps I'd be willing to uh, uh, take a whack at it here. We're up about, oh, 92 cents. You know what? I'm going to buy some euro right here. 
And let's just place that trade. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to put my stop just below this uh, 80. Uh, yeah, let's put it at 136.80. Let's see. Um, but ideally, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a return up to, oh, I don't know, right around maybe, say, uh, 137.20 area. All right, that's going to give me about 25 pips, uh, which is going to be about a 2 to 1 risk to reward. So I kind of like that. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm just going to show you here. Um, on the scalping program. Now, I know today is the free day, so I want to say, um, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome to uh, all of you who are coming out to check out FX Street. Um, as you guys know, they've got uh, uh, superior content on the uh, on the internet and for forex trading and for all things forex. You know, you've got a lot of experts that come here and, and you know give you their takes. So, you know, by all means, uh, uh, consider signing up with FX Street here. Um, so. For those of you who are regulars, though, you'll know that what we're looking at now is uh, the scalping program I use. It's a one-minute uh, scalping program on the Euro. Uh, it's a Heiken Ashi set up with three Bollinger Bands. If you guys have any questions about anything that I'm, that I'm looking at or doing, you know, by all means, ask away. But essentially what we're looking for here is we're looking for um, a doji confirmation to occur. All right, and then we're going to play red light, green light with this, and we're going to uh, see if we can stay in this thing as long as we stay uh, green here. So this looks like it's starting to move up a little bit uh, ahead here. We've got about, oh, four pips in. You know what? I'm just going to drop my uh, stop in, and I'll put the stop at, say, 85, because, uh, you know what, we might uh, take the money and run on this one quickly if it looks like it's going to reverse. But, um, you know what? No, I'm going to keep it at 80. Let's just, let's just be fair here. All right, so I'm going to put the stop back in at 80, and we'll just set that and let it go and see what happens. All right, so um, for those of you unaware, I'm, I use uh, FXCM's trading stations, um, and that's kind of what I do. Um, so, uh, okay, so we're going to keep an eye on Euro and see what happens. And getting back to the discussion about, you know, what's going on with stocks here, um, you know, we mentioned that um, we had the Fed minutes uh, yesterday. I don't know if anybody saw that, but the, uh, the release of the FOMC minutes from the meeting, and uh, I think there was a little bit of an expectation that there was going to be a little bit more happening than, than what we got. And I think part of that came from uh, Bernanke's speech to the uh, Joint Economic Committee, where this was the uh, beginning of the month, and this one was when markets were tanking. And I think, you know, he sort of got himself into a little bit of panic mode and just kind of blurted out, yeah, well, we'll do some more easing, you know, and, and that all of a sudden, you know, started to help stabilize the markets. And then shortly thereafter, we get this announcement from Merkel and Sarkozy that they're going to have a done deal in about a month's time. So everybody hang out, and then all of a sudden, the market sort of reversed. So we can see that the market's reversed here. Um, just back it out a little bit. I'll go to the uh, I don't know, four hour chart. And you can just see right around here was right when uh, this occurred. So, you know, that was one of the uh, uh, the things that happened that, um, you know, people were waiting to see in the minutes. Now, if Bernanke had come out and, you know, people were kind of hoping, I think, yesterday to see, okay, you know, they're pretty darn close to QE3. Well, why do people want more QE3? Well, we know it's the free money trade, right? Every time the Fed uh, turns on the printing press and expands monetary policy, all right, all that money goes to speculators who, you know, buy oil, buy gold, uh, buy stocks. Um, you know, they're not buying houses yet because the banks aren't lending. But, um, you know, the idea is that you're going to get this uh, money pump inflation going on. Well, you know, that's been happening for a while now, and uh, it, uh, it didn't actually um, come out. So uh, our question, Pat, for the Bollinger Bands, um, are you talking about on the scalping program or are you speaking about just in general? Um, just answer that one for me, and uh, we'll get back to that. Um, on the scalping program, okay. Uh, on the scalping program, we've actually got uh, three settings, okay? There's actually a one standard deviation, a two standard deviation, and a three standard deviation band. And the idea is that, you know, once we start getting towards these outer bands, all right, we're looking to fade the price action, okay? And then we're looking for our doji confirmation. Now, this doji right here wasn't a great confirmation. But if you remember, I actually entered the trade off of the five-minute chart all right, based on uh, these little candles here that we got. And it wasn't uh, so much on the uh, one-minute scalp deal, but, you know, that helps. So uh, let's see. So in my scalping, I'm only looking at stochastic, no RSI, no MACD. Uh, that's correct. And to be honest with you, I really don't even use the stochastic that much. Um, you know, a lot of times people get caught up with the indicators and, you know, you fire on 20 different indicators and this one tells you this and the other thing tells you different. You know, now your head's spinning. I just try to keep it simple with the stochastic. Um, I use a fast setting of a stochastic, the 553 setting, where um, I use that pretty much for all time frames. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing where any sort of 
um, indicator you use, you want to get used to the settings and, and you know, really get an idea of, of what they're telling you because, um, you know, what happens is, like, I, you know, for example, I find that MACD can be sometimes lagging, which, you know, if you're, we're going to be scalping off of a one-minute chart, you know, you don't want to have any lag time. But what I'm generally looking for is I'm looking to see overbought, oversold, and what's happening. Now, this is an interesting scenario. So right here, all right, this candle that we just saw, this red doji right there, is actually a reversal candle. All right, and under normal circumstances, I would probably take that, and that would indicate um, a short position. But I don't necessarily want to scalp this right now because, um, you know, I, I didn't enter this as a scalping trade. I just sort of hopped onto it with a five-minute trade. But, you know, looking at it here, it looks like we're going to get a little bit of a further push down. So perhaps uh, there is uh, going to be a scalp to the downside. And as you guys can see, I just went negative on this trade a couple of pips. But I'm trading this off the five minute right now, so I'm going to sit tight with my uh, 136.80 area, and we'll see if uh, if this can hold. Um, and you know what I'm also going to do? I want to take a look at S&P. All right, we know about the, uh, the correlation here between uh, S&P and Euro. Um, pretty highly correlated because Euro is the anti-dollar. All right, S&P 500 and dollar are fairly inversely correlated. Um, so usually dollar strength means S&P weakness and vice versa. And you can see here we were getting a little bit of a push higher on S&P. All right, and we have this oversold um, condition down here. So I'm going to hang out and uh, just sit in the euro for a little bit. And I'm not, you know, I'm not too worried about it. I've got a, I don't know, what do we call this, a 12 pip stop or a 14 pip stop. So, you know, I'm going to be okay with that. And we're looking for about, oh, 25 to 30 pips of upside. So that satisfies a two-to-one risk-to-reward criteria. All right, questions. Uh, is the euro correcting down the trend line or has it reversed to the long side on a larger time frame? Um, that's a good question, and you know it comes down to uh, you know what people uh, want to use as trend identification. For example, if we look at this on a daily chart, all right, you can back it out, and well, it doesn't look as too much. So let's I'm going to pull this out of the weekly chart just so we can see what's happening on the weekly chart, right? And if you look at the weekly chart here, all right, you can see that we're sort of in this what what I call range bound activity, right? So we had this move higher here, which, you know, you call an uptrend, and the uptrend gets broken. All right, now we look like we're in a little bit of a downtrend. All right, but now, boom, we get this little spike here. All right, so I'm thinking that, you know, 140 is probably going to be a decent area of resistance here, and that will probably put in another, uh, you know, range, um, you know, right around here. I would say 134 maybe to 140. All right, as, as, you know, people get impatient with what's going on in the Eurozone, as, as new information comes out, if there's some sort of, you know, problem or something like that. But you can see my stochastic settings just about to roll over here, showing us um, that we're in a little bit of an oversold here. All right, so it's, it's the kind of thing where, you know, you really have to identify which trends you're looking at. Because for me, most of the trading I do is on uh, shorter-term trading. So it's the swing trading, it's day trading. Um, so I'm not really concerned about that weekly trend as much. But, you know, I look at something like the two-hour chart. All right, when I see the two-hour chart, I can see, you know, nice little moves like this, nice little moves like this. All right, you can see that on the two-hour chart, the 20-period MA uh, has broken. All right, the middle Bollinger Band is 20-period uh, SMA. All right, so perhaps this is going to be um, a new uh, push back down. But, you know, when I look at the, the moves that occurred up here, doesn't really show me that, you know, there was some resistance, but it didn't look like it was that great a resistance. And it looks, you know, sort of like these moves you see where it comes up, pulls back a little bit, sets up a bottom. So perhaps we're going to pull back to, say, the S1 daily pivot support. All right, pivot points are something that I like to use um, as far as, you know, trying to find areas of hidden support and resistance. Okay, because when we're sort of in these range-bound markets, and, you know, depending upon your definition of range, um, I think the pivots do a pretty decent job of letting us know where we are. So, you know, we could see a pullback here to this S1, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what's going on for the rest of today. And, okay, yeah, we've got uh, S&P and stocks selling off because things don't look so hot. But, I mean, are, are you know, people really want to uh, uh, sell down the market this much today, or are we going to potentially see a rebound? If we see a rebound, I think Euro can move along with it. So that's sort of been the thesis that I've been going with. And, you know, when I look at these different um, charts that are out there and the different things happening, you know, it's it's always for me. It's a it's a the first thing I'm looking at is technicals, right? But I also want to put it within a framework of the fundamental landscape and what's happening. You know, and there's times when you know, as Ed mentioned in the previous uh, webinar, that you know you can't be confident in what's going on in the eurozone right now. You know, you just can't. But if you look at everything else around it, you know, things um, are starting to look better. 
And when I say better, um, you know, we're starting to see bad numbers come in, but there hasn't been anything that's been a total, complete disaster. I mean, let's take a look here at um, uh, British Pound here. Okay, British Pound is uh, starting to sell off a little bit. Uh, no news, okay, but just started selling because, you know, the numbers are coming in a little bit weaker than they'd like. But if you think about what's going on in the U.K., all right, the U.K., um, you know, they're talking about, okay, well, they just increased easing over there. Uh, they've got this government austerity taking place, and they've got declining numbers. Well, you know, I heard somebody here in the U.S. say, you know, well, well look at the U.K., their numbers look off. Yeah, but you got to take that in context when you say, all right, well, their economic numbers don't look great, but they're cutting their debt. All right, at least they don't have bad economic numbers, and they're increasing their debt. So, you know, the government austerity there is actually trying to get things back into order, and that's, you know, how these things should work. So, um, you know, when I look at the euro, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens there, but I think this is going to be a lot of range bound uh, there, uh, money magnet. All right, so this question. Also, no MAs on my scalping chart, uh, just the BBs? Uh, yes, Mike. Um, the reason is is that um, it's really, I mean, you know, we're talking about being on a one-minute chart here, and I don't look at things like, you know, MA crossovers, things like that. This is a, a specific chart. This is a Hike and Ashy chart, which is different from candlesticks. Don't be confused about that. Um, so, oh, wow, look at that. That reversal for the scalp actually would have been pretty good here. You should have just done that. <laughs> Um, but we're going to wait and see on the five minutes, see what happens. But, yeah, the idea with the Bollinger Bands is that we're looking for sharp moves that occur in one direction. All right, the bands are really going to react to uh, uh, any sort of momentum that occurs. All right, and then we're looking for a halt of that momentum, hopefully near the outside of the band, where we can, boom, fade that price action and come back in. So perhaps, um, depending upon what happens with this overall euro position, perhaps maybe we'll do just a little bit of scalping. But you can see here the moves have been fairly tight, with the exception of that opening range move, which, of course, I missed and only took 12 pips. Um, I offer a, a free trade alert service out on Twitter where um, if you guys want to follow me out there, I'll put the uh, uh, my Twitter uh, thing up here for you so you can take a look. It's just at uh, 4X Mentor Mike, uh, and I'll put that up there for everybody right now. But I have this uh, free trade alerts deal where um, you know, I came out and I, I called that trade this morning, and then I just got impatient with it. And it didn't look so hot, and I got fooled by the S&P thing, and of course piked out. And then what happened? The uh, the trade basically uh, came to fruition. So that was about 35 pips there that I was looking for. I only took 12, so it happens, you know. Even guys uh, uh, who they let go speak on webinars uh, will pike out of trades too. So that uh, that happens. Um, so you mean MAs as support and resistance? Um, no, I don't use the MAs for support and resistance because. You know, when you look at this one-minute chart, right, I mean, you're talking about looking at a snapshot, right? We're looking at about one hour's worth of activity right here. So in this one-hour uh, time frame, you know, we don't really have an idea of, God, is Euro up today? Is it down today? What's the what's the deal with it? I mean, we're just talking about looking for short-term moves, okay? And a lot of times, uh, two ways you can basically trade this setup. You can um, trade the setup that you play red light, green light, where you essentially – once you uh, identify uh, the new move, you can get into it, and then, you know, just wait until you get, um, I think it's six candles out, and then once you get a change in the color, all right, you bail out of the trade. Or, you know, if you've got bands that are starting to flatten out right this, that means that uh, the volatility is decreasing a little bit, all right, and that you may get a lot of sideways action. Let me um, see if I can pull this back here. We see something like this where you see a lot of candles happening, and then the bands tighten up a lot. Okay, where, you know, you're not going to get any action. You can scalp this using um, short uh, uh, targets um, if you wanted to, all right? But usually when you get this very tight action, you're going to get a breakout one way or the other. So it looks like right now, all right, we're starting to tighten up just a little bit here, which, you know, that's okay for me because I'm hoping that the breakout's going to be to the upside, not the downside. And then when I look at, um, you know, come back and look at something like the five-minute chart, um, here for Euro, I'll also see, okay, this looks like there's some possibility. Okay, I'm checking S&P just to see what's going on there. Man, look at that thing. <laughs> it just kept pounding it. Um, but I think pound's moving up here. Is that not correct? Yeah, a little decent move on the pound happening here. So that's interesting. So, you know, I, I really think we're starting to just see these range-bound activity because, um, you know, we've got these markets where, um, there's sort of, you know, as I mentioned, that thing about the clock ticking, you know, and you're just sitting there waiting, and it's like, okay, we're waiting for, uh, you know, Merkel and Sarkozy to tell us that everything's going to be fine in the Eurozone, 
you know, we're waiting here in the U.S. for this debt super committee. I don't even know when they're supposed to meet, but for them to come out, you know, figure out how to reduce the deficit here in the U.S., and then we're waiting for jobs, and we're always waiting for jobs. I mean, when are those going to improve, right? So it's, it's you know, it's very difficult uh, for markets to get a to get a, a good idea of what's going on. But you know, there's there's a couple of things going on. It's interesting. I'm actually going to uh, a J.P. Morgan conference uh, breakfast. I don't know. It's like in two weeks or something like that, where uh, they're going to discuss. Um, you know how uh, equities can uh, uh, move potentially in a, in a rising uh, interest rate or a rising dollar environment, and that's going to be interesting to, to see because you know we have these correlations in the market where you know it's, it's dollar up, stocks down, vice versa. But you know we have all these other countries around the globe who have uh, you know strong currencies because the dollar is so weak, and it's sort of hurting this entire global uh, growth that's going on. And at some point. You know, there may be this, uh, you know, renewed race to the bottom, and all of a sudden, uh, dollar is going to strengthen. And if that occurs, is there going to be a scenario where stocks can rise in that environment? And, you know, I think that there is, but, you know, there just needs to be uh, a little bit of market capitulation from, you know, the normal correlations. Because, you know, these correlations will break down over time. Um, and when they do, it's usually not a pretty thing, because everybody who relies on them gets smoked. Um, you know, I remember uh, once upon a time, I guess it was five or six years ago, uh, yeah, that sounds about right, when uh, oil and uh, stocks used to be negatively correlated, inversely correlated. So if oil prices went up, stocks went down. Well, the logic was that if prices are going up on oil, that's going to mean that there's inflation. It means there's cost of doing business costs more. That's bad for the bottom line for businesses. So stocks would go down, oil would go up. And, if you know, if you're, if you're looking around at what goes on today, it's oil up, stocks up, because it's just risk on, risk off. Okay, so uh, you know this is all based on uh, Fed monetary policy, you know, and they'll try and tell you oil prices still related to supply and demand. But I mean, you know, let's be honest about it. Um, so those uh, are the type of things that happen. So let's see. So question: So is S&P following currencies or currency following S&P? And what is my opinion of the 20% temp drop uh, in S&P last week? Well, I, I think uh, a couple of things. I think that um, the S&P is was following currencies, all right, and now I think that uh, currencies are going to start to follow the S&P. Now, you know, it's hard to say who's, uh, you know, who's the boss, if you will, um, when you know you consider these moves that occur. But right now we've got corporate earnings season going on in the U.S., so you know we're going to get a better idea of how stocks are doing. So you know, can stocks? do well in, in this sort of uh, a bad economic malaise? Well, sure. I mean, we know about the difference between Wall Street and Main Street. We've got the Occupy Wall Street people out. I get to see them every other day when I hit the uh, office downtown. Quite an interesting group and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of clever banners, I must say. Um, I have some friends who told me they saw a great one. Uh, I won't tell you exactly what it said, but basically it said jump, and then they used an expletive to identify the people they were hoping to jump out of the windows. So there's a disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street. But, you know, companies can be lean and mean. They can fire people. They can reduce costs. They can keep money on the sidelines. Okay? They don't have to invest right now. They haven't been investing right now, which is the cause of major unemployment. It has to do with the uncertainty of the economy. We've got Obamacare. We've got a potential for higher taxes. We've got this increased regulation, Dodd-Frank. So people are just sort of sitting on the sidelines. But, you know, if, if earnings start doing better, people are going to say, hey, wait a sec. You know, listen, we're not getting any interest in bonds. All right. Is, is there? Uh, do we need to have this much safety? Well, you know, we're, we're starting to think that maybe they're going to finally have a solution in Europe. All right. We got to be in stocks. If, if anything, if it's just dividend-paying stocks, because dividend-paying stocks are going to pay you more than bonds do right now. So there's going to be a rush, I think, to buy stocks. So in this case, I think stocks can lead to currencies. But you know, when the uh, stuff hits the fan, if you will, if, if they come out and all of a sudden this uh, uh, you know announcement by Merkel and Sarkozy turns out to be a bunch of BS and they don't have a plan in early in November, then boom, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, a, a big sell-off happen at that point because, you know, they've set the timeline now, so now they have to deliver. So it's going to uh, vacillate back and forth depending upon who's leading, but, you know, you can generally get the idea based on where the risk is coming from in the marketplace. So I think that's what we're seeing. The EU and GU have almost no correlation today going opposite most of the day. Great data scalp euro pound yeah um i think so let's take a look at it here this is uh, uh interesting and you know we could see that as well wow look at that nice move happening there i'm just going to pull this out we're just looking at the five minute chart but 
Oh, why is this not showing me there? Uh, let's go back. I want to look at this on a 15-minute chart and just see what's happening. Yeah, wow. As soon as that broke down, okay. Nice move lower, but perhaps uh, we're going to get a little bit of support here, say at 87 cents on the uh, uh, S2 pivot. Um, so that could be uh, interesting. Let's jam this back to the five minute. Maybe we'll keep an eye on this and see if we get any decent candle action and potentially come in here and buy at 87. But yeah, you can see where the uh, where the uh, the drivers of the market have been. I mean, you know, they talked about this uh, China slowdown. Overnight, which you know their export slowed to only 17% growth. Uh, their trade surplus was only 14 billion. Uh, the U.S. reported a trade deficit of 45 billion. Um, so I don't think anyone's going to be uh, uh, losing any sleep over China's problems and you know their complaints about their currency strengthening too much. And of course, we've got this Senate bill, which you know I think is well intentioned, but uh, I think it's got the wrong message and potentially starting a trade war in this economic environment is probably not a good idea. Um, but, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe uh, uh, China doesn't call their bluff and, uh, you know, goes ahead and does something with their currency. Who knows? But, um, you know, when you talk about uh, different trade figures going on, all right, that's that's one issue that's hit the market. But the other one is that, you know, you got this monthly report uh, from the ECB, um, and, you know, they came out with the usual, oh, you know, things look like they're slowing, moderate growth, sluggish economy, you know, all, the, all these things we know about, okay? So, you know, it's just one of these days where, you know, there had been a lot of uh, 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 risk appetite in the market for the past, say, a week or so, you know, with stocks banging up higher. And, you know, sometimes you get a little bit of profit taking on a little bit of negative news, all right? People weren't thrilled with J.P. Morgan's earnings this morning, okay? You get potential China slowdown, perhaps a trade war brewing. All right, you get a bad uh, report from the ECB, but really, is anything that much different than it was yesterday when the market went gangbusters or the day before? No, not really. And I think, you know, until we, uh, uh, you know, start to hear something or see something as far as, you know, hey, there's a, there's a problem with this ECB deal or, you know what, this U.S., uh, uh, you know, jobs thing is never going to happen and super committees messed up and all these things, but we have some time for that. So um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. So, all right, so, yeah. I, uh, I like this uh, Euro pound. Uh, we didn't really take a peek at it, but that looks uh, pretty nice today. And, all right, look at there. There's, there goes our Euro, steady, uh, slowly but surely. Come on, baby. You can see here the uh, the middle band's down to about oh, 137.14. And, you know, I like to use that middle band as sort of uh, my what I would call my first uh, profit target, if you will, um, first area of resistance. Because, you know, the 20 period tends to, even on the five-minute chart, be a little bit more significant than, the, uh, the uh, 10 period MAs, and you know, you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out these risk to reward calculations in your head. You know, if you can get two to one on a trade uh, before it bounces up and hits that 20, that's usually a pretty good indicator that um, you know that the trade might be worthwhile from a, 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 an expectancy standpoint. Now, of course, you can see that as this thing plays out and lengthens out, that you know the 20s coming down, and now perhaps we might not be able to get that original target of say. Uh, what I say, 137.20, which, you know what, that's okay because, you know, there's times when, you know, you're going to go in, you're going to want to place a profit target. There's going to be other times when you don't. You want to just sort of manage the trade. If, if you notice, I placed my stop on this trade, but I didn't place a limit, you know, because I'm hoping actually for a little bit more. You know, I'm hoping for this thing to sort of settle out, rebound, maybe we bust through that middle uh, middle band there, and then we go back up to the top of the band, revisit the highs earlier today of 137.40, thereabouts. So that's really what I'm hoping for. But, you know, right now I'm just content with the entry because there's not a whole heck of a lot happening. And, again, we've got 14 pips of risk on this trade. So, you know, hoopy do. Um, I made 12 earlier. That's going to put me minus two today if I'm wrong. But I'm giving myself an opportunity upside, and that's what the trade is about. So uh, let's see. Uh, settings for the BB on the five-minute chart, just a standard uh, 20, uh, 20 and two standard deviation. So nothing, uh, nothing world beating here. And that's – you know, part of what it is I do, um, you know, when I talk about trading made simple, you talk about, you know, these webinars, it's, you know, I'm not trying to complicate things with so many different programs and, uh, you know, settings and, and indicators and all these things. I mean, I really just try and keep it, uh, you know, as easy as possible. You know, I used to have uh, what you call spaghetti charts, and I'm sure a lot of you folks have that as well, where, you know, you got 20 different MAs up there and you got three different indicators and, you know, you look at the thing and you got to, like, you know, pull it apart and get to the, the, the heart of the matter, what's going on. And, and what you really want to look for is price action. 
And that's sort of what I would call trading made simple. It's just price action trading. And that's primarily what I look to do. So, you know, there's uh, there's time and a place for everything. And, you know, when I get something special, like, you know, this like little one-minute scalping deal, I mean, that's a, uh, an anomaly. You know, that's a little bit different. And, well, you can see there, there was another nice uh, doji setup. Okay, and you could have come in and just put the stop just below the band, all right, and play red light, green light. So we're going to see what happens. So this looks like it's picking up here a little bit. We're above 137, and 137 um, is, uh, you know, going to be one of these areas where, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, movement back and forth because, you know, based on the law of round numbers, people tell you it's real significant. I mean, if you look at it from a, uh, just uh, let's break it out a little bit on 30-minute chart. If you look at it from this perspective, you know, 137 is not that important in the grand scheme of things. So I'm hoping that we get this bounce here, at least back up to the bottom of uh, what was previously support. All right, maybe we get a move. But you can see here, stochastic starting to roll over a little bit, which is not loving, which means we could test that 136.80 area, but who knows, right? That's If we all had crystal balls, this would be easy, and we wouldn't be here, right? So essentially, we're just taking calculated risks. That's, uh, that's what we're hoping to do. But on the five-minute chart, it's looking better. All right, we've got a big whopping six pips, seven pips uh, going here, which uh, eight, eight, look at that. Uh, nine, holy cow, look at this thing, it's on fire. <laughs> if, uh, you know, for some shorter term traders, you know, they don't mind taking the uh, the pips off, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I always say, you know, you're not going to go broke taking profits. Um, but, of course, if, you know, you have uh, uh, losers that are twice as big as your winners, then you're going to potentially have a problem, especially if you don't have a high winning percentage. But, you know, I tend to have a pretty decent winning uh, percentage, so I try to, you know, you try and stay with the trade when you can, but there's times when you just got to go. And it was like this morning when I bailed on that other stupid thing. But, oh, well. Let's see. Uh, I think there's a 137 option expiration today. Um, Got to tell you, I'm not certain about that. Um, option expiration, uh, and to be honest with you, I'm not, uh, you know, too versed in currency options. But my understanding was uh, that those uh, option expirations occur on uh, Fridays, which I guess is tomorrow. But, you know, again, I don't know. And, and if there's uh, option expiration at 137, there's going to be option expiration at just about every strike price. So 137, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be an important figure because of options expiry. Okay, the 138s are going to expire at the same time. The 136s are. It just really depends on on, on where the uh, uh, the money is. And, you know, playing the option expiration game, that can, you know, sometimes provide volatility. It can other times sort of slow things down and just peg prices. So, you know, it, it's tough to get involved, um, you know, with that that perspective. And it's more of a, of, of a quantitative approach. But, um, you know, it's possible options are expiring, sure. Um, all right. So here I'm moving here. We got about a big whopping 10 pips in the hopper. Um, I'm probably going to let this puppy ride for a little bit and just kind of wait and see. Um, that anybody with questions about anything or anything you want to look at, you know, I hate to just bore us with the Euro USD because everybody trades that. And you can see pounds actually moving a little bit better here. Look at that, which means that Euro pound. Let's take a look at this one. Maybe we're retesting that that area. Where the heck is it? Yeah, we're coming back down a little bit. I'm thinking maybe a, a buy um, ahead of this pivot might be in order if we can get maybe a little bit of a push down. Let's see. Do I usually scalp a few pairs at the same time, having a few one-minute charts closely arranged side by side, monitor large multi monitors? Uh, that's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, I don't usually scalp more than uh, one or two pairs because um, you know the short-term nature of, of the scalping program I use. When I'm doing something on like the five-minute, okay, like like the euro trade we put on, you know that I'll have multiple of those going at all times. But if I'm on this bad boy right here, no, I'm sitting here and I'm watching it and I'm trying to wait and see. Because as soon as I see that reversal candle or that move to, uh, you know, hit the outside of the band or, you know, the, the change in, in direction, I'm probably going to bail on this trade from a scalping perspective. So, you know, you can sometimes keep a lot of them up, but uh, it's really up to you um, and how much you can follow. To be honest with you, I, 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 I don't like to scalp that much. I mean, this, this program's good enough and I've gotten good enough with it that it's, it's successful for me. But given my druthers, I'd much rather... Uh, place a trade on the five-minute chart, set the stop, not even pay attention, let the market do the work, versus uh, you know me having to sort of grind it out. Um, but you know, if you have a multi-monitor setup, you can see uh, there goes my cursor there, and oh, I guess it's bound by the thing. But um, 
you know, it's uh, it's up to you. But what I like to do with it is I like to use pairs that have uh, uh, tight spreads because you don't want um, a lot of your profit to get eaten up by larger spreads. But, you know, it depends because there will be a couple of good moves that happen during the day. And a lot of times with this program and, and the way that the scalping works is that, you know, you, you might not necessarily know where your target is. I mean, if you're playing red light, green light, you know, you, you just don't know where it's going to end. This thing could go, 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 go. So from a risk to reward perspective, it's, it's kind of hard to get a handle on it. But, like, for example, you know, on this one where, gosh, I got in back there, right, you can see that this one played out for a while, and I wasn't playing red light, green light. I was actually on the five-minute chart. But had I been, you know, could have stayed in it till, you know, potentially down here or even down here, um, you know, once you start hitting these outer bands. And, uh, you know, you just don't know. So it's a little bit, you know, scalping's a little bit different than, say, traditional day trading and or swing trading, where, you know, in those situations, you want to make sure that you've got that positive expectancy, that two-to-one uh, risk to reward at least, um, or excuse me, reward to risk. Um, that would be an upside-down trade. But with scalping, it's really more about finding uh, a higher percentage of winning trades and then just keeping the risk low and letting the winners run if you can. So... You know, all right, we're getting a little bit of a pullback, and you can see that we got some uh, choppy action happening here. Uh, perhaps this little bad boy would be uh, classified as a reversal here, but maybe not so fast. You know, I want to go back here and look at this on the five minute though, and you can see that this is just a little bit of problems, you know, bumping up here against the uh, the middle band here. All right, what we're hoping for is we're hoping for a push above the middle band, and then we get a close above the band. Because if we get the close above the band, we're going to expect that we're going to revisit the top of the band, which could give us um, a little bit more uh, uh, juice there. But you can see that we're starting to get up towards the silver bought area. All right, so maybe we're going to get like one big push or something like that. Um, and maybe we'll get the same in Euro Pound, okay, which yeah, it just looks like it's sitting right in there. So we've got Pound pulling back a little bit, I think. You can see pound dollar. Okay, so a little bit of a sell off there. Euro going up a little bit. Euro pound moving up. So you can see how you can sort of triangulate with these things and just sort of uh, keep an eye on them. But, you know, here we are with 10 pips. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's you know, depending upon the type of day you've got, you know, that may be all you can really extract from these trades. And, you know, if I can do a trade of 12 pips earlier, a trade of 10 pips now, you know, typically my daily target's around 50 pips for the day. And, you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to, you know, get on the webinar and manage, you know, four or five different trades. So I like to just keep it <laughs> to a few. But, you know, there's there's going to be times when, you know, you, you don't have the bigger moves. They're not going to be present for you. And if you don't take advantage of them, then uh, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do. So let's see. Mike usually looks at several one-minute charts and just picking the best setups, but he still uses MAs and two or three indicators on each. Well, I mean, if, if it's working for you, Mike, I, you know, I, I can't tell you to do anything different. You know, I mean, you know, I've, I've work with clients who have no idea what they're doing in the markets and, and make a, a ton of money. So, you know, you don't necessarily uh, have to do things my way or anybody else's way for that matter. It's, it's what really works for you is what's important. And if, you know, you can read them and, and it's, you know, it works, hey, good for you. That's great, man. Stick with it. So, uh, let's see. Uh, how many trades do I average per day or week? Um, hard to say. I mean, it really depends on the action. I mean, usually uh, range-bound activity means more trades for me. Um, when, uh, you know, we have more trending markets, hopefully I've, I've caught in the beginning of, of the minor trend. I'm just sort of sitting in the thing, letting it go. Or what you know, usually happens more often than not is that, I, you know, I miss the, uh, the start of the move, and then it's very difficult to, to sort of jump on when you think it's near highs or, you know, you're not certain how much further it can go. So, you know, trending markets are actually um, a little bit worse for me. I prefer the volatility. So I would say on an average day, probably anywhere from, oh, 3 to 12 trades. And, uh, you know, you multiply that by the week, say, 35 to 50 trades for the week. And that's probably about what I'm doing. But it depends. You know, sometimes just using, uh, you know, small uh, lot sizes. Um, other times from scalping, I'm, I'm using bigger lot sizes. So, you know, volume can change. So I don't really think about it in terms of, uh, you know, how many trades I'm doing, or I don't have a guideline that I stick to, but it's really more about what the market's going to give me. So, All right. So we're uh, sort of nearing the end here, and it looks like Euro's still moving, wants to uh, test this uh, uh, middle band here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike's been scalping on the one-minute charts for the last couple of years. Any other time frames, he gets bored. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Sounds like... Uh, 
you got a need for speed there, Mike. I got to tell you, you know, I've been uh, trading these markets, uh, not just currency, but futures and, and stocks for oh the past 12 years. And you know, my eyesight shot. I'm a pretty young guy still, and you know, I just I don't know. I feel tired. You know, <laughs> it's like sometimes it's just tough to sit in front of that screen and bang it out like that. Um, you know, and it's, it's sort of a uh, I don't want to call it a younger man's game, but you know, for me, man, I, I just got burned out on on that shorter term trading. So. You know, with a market like the currency market in Forex, you know, a lot of times you get these nice intraday trends where you, know, you just sort of let the market do the heavy lifting and the work for you. And, hey, if I can do that, I prefer it than having to grind it out scalping. But if it's not there, it's not there. And sometimes you just have to take what the market gives you. So it's nice to be able to have options to do both. Do we have any other questions about anything I may have said today or introduced or discussed and or uh, confused you with? Have I, uh, you know, is everybody uh, sort of up to speed on what I'm talking about? Does anybody uh, uh, not understand something going on in the world or if there's something wacky happening on a chart or anything you want to look at? By all means, we've got a couple minutes left here. Uh, go ahead, ask away. You want my uh, uh, predictions for uh, the World Series or for, uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, it's, it's, you know, one of the things is, uh, being a trader is I try to keep my predictions to a minimum. And, uh, you know, really just sort of follow what the market's doing, take what the market gives me. And, uh, you know, those are uh, uh, times when, you know, you just hope that what you're seeing, uh, the outcome follows through. So, um, you know, a lot of things going on in this world today, a lot of craziness. Uh, my wife was supposed to be over in Egypt next week. Uh, that just got canceled. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, stuff going on around the world, which... You know, sometimes you got to keep an eye on these global politics, see what's going on. I mean, you know, they're talking about this uh, deal with Iran right now, you know, and, and, you know, to be honest with you, if, you know, until uh, I don't know how, you know, believable or, you know, I don't want to say unbelievable, but, you know, this whole thing is it's it's just sort of uh, uh, the timing is questionable. Let's just say that. But, you know, we haven't seen that spike in oil that you might think if there's going to be some sort of um, action coming to a head. You know, perhaps we could see oil moving up, which means we could see uh, a dollar, uh, you know, weakening, or we could see that correlation breakdown occur as well. So a lot of different things can happen. Uh, let's see. More to see. Do you MACD and how do I use it? Uh, uh, quick question. On which time frames do I normally look at when scalping on the one minute? Um I'm not sure about that question, Mike. Uh, one minute's the one minute. That's the time frame I'm watching. Um, sometimes I'll jump back and look at the like the five minute. If you're talking about, you know, if I'm trying to get overall market uh, direction and things like that, I usually um, uh, will look at the two hour, the thirty minute, and the five minute. Those are my bread and butter time frames for just looking at day stuff. Um, and then, you know, the one minute I'm looking at when I'm just doing one minute stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, little, 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 uh, James is laughing out loud. I'm not certain. And Nick's asking about uh, MACD. If so, how do I use it? I don't typically use the MACD for shorter term stuff. Um, I, I would use it for longer term uh, trades and sort of, uh, I guess what we'll just call uh, investments. But I tend to find MACD is a little bit lagging, so it doesn't have a lot of use for me. So in any event, um, I've got to get moving here, folks. Uh, they're giving me the hook. But it's been great speaking with you. For those of you here at FX Street for the first time, welcome. You know, by all means, scope it out and get involved. Um, if you guys want to see what I've got going on, um, I just put my Twitter thing up there for you before. Uh, it's at Forex Mentor Mike. Hop on. I'm throwing out free trade calls all the time. Um, I also, uh, you know, edit a website I've got. It's called ForexNews.com. It's got up to uh, the minute breaking news from around the globe. Very cool site. And then lastly, um, I offer, uh, uh, Forex education to serious traders online uh, via uh, online courses, plus I do a one-on-one -on -one mentor program. So if you're interested in that, reach out to me. And uh, thanks again all. So long. Uh, good trade until next time. Bye now.